I have a lot of viewers ask me at one time or another to provide them with some sort of list of philosophical texts or philosophical thinkers. Um, sometimes they're very general ideas, sometimes they're more specific, like what would be the top ten existentialist texts that you would, you would uh, suggest me to read. And recently my, my friend and former classmate from Lakeland College, Daniel Callahan, asked me about a, a similar kind of list, a top ten list. Um, he wanted one down to even, you know, addition and translation, and I'm not going to try to provide any of those sort of details here. I think I will do that in a different video. But it got me thinking uh, quite a bit. I've put off creating any sort of listing like that, in part because it's very difficult to do. I've given a lot of thought to, to the one that I'm about to give you here, and I'm going to give it to you in the short form and the long form, the top five and the top ten. And these are the top five or ten philosophical works that I would bring with me to a desert island. If I could only read these ten works or these five works for the rest of my life, what would they be? And this is very different than asking about if you could only read ten philosophers, anything that you, that you like from their works uh, for the rest of your life, what would they be? Because in that case, some of the people who didn't make it in here would probably make it in, like say Nietzsche or, or Kierkegaard. Um, but there are certain works that are great, not only because they're great in themselves, but because they encapsulate a whole bunch of other viewpoints. So when you read them, you are not only engaging with that thinker, you're engaging with that thinker's take on this thinker, this thinker, this thinker, this thinker. And I, I also steer towards the ones that are more systematic, that have a lot more meat, you could say, that are, that are elaborating a huge master argument of some type. So, Top uh, five, I'm going to give you those first, and then I'll expand it to the top ten. So, number one, Plato's Republic. Uh, number two, Augustine's City of God. Number three, Thomas Aquinas's Soma Theologiae. Uh, number four, De Descartes' Meditations. And number five, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. So those are the five that I would take with me if I could only pick five to read for the rest of my life, to take to the desert island or under the sea or into the cave or the bomb shelter or what, what have you. Um, if I was allowed to expand it to ten, what would I bring with me? This is going to seem kind of an eclectic list. Um, Aristotle's Metaphysics. That was a very tough choice, and I'll tell you why in a bit. Uh, Pascal's Pensées, and then it's three what I consider to be really great classics of 20th century European thought. Um, one of them is probably not a big surprise to, to many people. It's Heidegger's Being in Time. And the next two are probably a little less well known, but I, I consider them to be equal in, in quality to Plato's Republic or Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit or, or Martin Heidegger's Being in Time. One of them is Mach Shaler's Formalism in Ethics and Non-Formal Ethics of Values. Um, and then the, the last one would be the guy who I wrote my dissertation on, who I, I still um, am very fond of, Maurice Blondel's first master work, his own dissertation, Oxion 1893. So let me tell you why I would pick these particular works. Plato's Republic, that's, a, that's almost a no-brainer. I think if you put together important works, lists of philosophy, this one almost always makes it in. Um, there may be a few people who want to show how you know independent thinkers they are when it comes to Plato, and they'll put the Phaedrus or the Symposium or the Gorgias or who knows, the Protagoras or something like that in there. But most people acknowledge that that the Republic is really his 
his masterwork, if there is any that you want to call Plato's masterwork. And the reason why I would bring it along is really any Platonic dialogue that I've taught, and I've taught quite a few of them in my classes, um, every time I go back to them I find more and more interesting stuff that I, I want to think about more. As a matter of fact, my old uh, uh, Greek professor, who I read the symposium with over the course of a semester, Rick Williams, he had been reading the symposium for 30 years, and he would say, I can't put it down because every time I come back, I've got new questions. And Plato's good for that because of the way in which he wrote, because of the profundity of the thought, because of his understanding of, of not just human nature in general, but of types of, of thinkers. And you, you get all of that here in this work in the Republic. Um, I had a friend who actually taught an intro to philosophy class just using the Republic because you've got metaphysics, ethics, political philosophy, aesthetics, epistemology, um, philosophy of human nature. You've got a whole bunch of different things rolled into it. So I don't really care whether you know, you're using the Bloom translation or not, but I, I would definitely include the Republic. So that's, that's number one. Number two, Augustine's City of God. Now, you might say, why the City of God and not, say, the Confessions, if it's going to be Augustine? Well, the City of God, okay, it doesn't have the narrative that um, the Confessions does. And, and I really do enjoy that, that narrative. But it's, you know, it's got a ton of stuff in here. And Augustine engages with other philosophers in the course of the discussions. The entire work, The City of God, is really a, a defense of, of Christianity uh, as, as a, a system of life, a system of thought, as opposed to other ways of looking at things in response to accusations that Christianity was weakening the Roman Empire. So Augustine has a, a, a huge design in writing this. He covers all sorts of uh, amazing, you know, things in here. Some of it, I would say, admittedly, is not really philosophy. Some of it, you know, is clearly straying, you know, into, into theology. But it's, um, it's really worth reading and rereading, uh, you know. Like with Plato, the more times you go through it, the, the more you get out of it. So that would take us to, you know, the cusp between ancient and, and medieval. And then, you know, if I'm allowed to bring entire books, Thomas Aquinas, he did write a book, which is available in multiple volumes, called the Summa Theologiae. And in a way, it's sort of like cheating, isn't it, to say... Well, I'm going to bring the Summa along, um, but it was supposed to be one unified work. Maybe you could say, well, you could only bring, you know, one part of the Summa along, and then I would have to think about, well, which part would I actually pick? Would it be the first part? Would it be the first part of the second? Would it be the second part of the second? Those are the ones I'd probably, you know, steer towards the most. But, I mean, the Summa is, is magnificent in that it, it, it is engaging with practically everybody who Thomas had ever read in one point or another. It's a systematic attempt to try to treat not only Christian doctrine, but everything you could think about that's relevant about human nature, society, metaphysics, epistemology, and even, you know, the philosophy of the emotions. Um... Aquinas is, is sort of taking the best of whatever it is that he comes across from the Christian world, from Jewish thinkers, from Muslim thinkers, from, from pagan thinkers, and bringing them all together and trying to think them out in some sort of unity. So it's really a phenomenal work, and you could spend the rest of your life just, just you know, studying the Summa, uh, and that would be a worthwhile application of one's time. Number four. This one's a little bit different. I have, I have the, the, this French version, which I particularly like because it's got not only the, the meditations 
and the objections and the replies, but it also has the Latin below the, the uh, French, because originally Descartes wrote it in Latin, and then it was translated into French. So if I had to pick a version, it would be something like this. I have another version which, which actually has uh, the Latin and the French um, facing each other, which is kind of nice. Why would I pick Descartes' meditations? Descartes is not doing what I just said that Plato or Augustine or Aquinas are doing, which is, you know, sort of engaging everybody else. He's, he's trying to sweep everything away and then um, rebuild. What he's doing is, is still indebted to medieval scholasticism, as, as Gilson showed in his, his uh, early work. And there's some continuities between Augustine and, and Descartes that are kind of interesting to look at as well. And I, I just love Descartes um, for the force of his thought. I don't actually buy into his, his metaphysics, but I think it's very interesting to think about. Um, if I had to pick, you know, a viewpoint that I don't espouse to be the viewpoint that I do espouse, perhaps it would be that of Descartes. So I, I know I could certainly read his, his meditations profitably the rest of my life. And when you add in the, the objections and his replies to them, then you, you get like an extra bonus. So then we come to number five, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. And... I've always, you know, I've always loved Hegel since I started reading him. Um, every time that I do the work of working my way through this massive, complex, uh, difficult tome, I get more out of it. I can't say that I fully understand Hegel at this point, um, even though I'm, I'm, you know, teaching this this online uh, series on on Hegel. Um, frankly, I don't even know if Hegel completely got Hegel. When you come down to it, uh, there's so much here. And, and again, you have something kind of similar to, you know, it, Hegel is the Thomas Aquinas of the modern age, trying to synthesize all these different perspectives into one systematic unity that can actually be comprehended and, and make sense. And he does it in terms of a metaphysics of, of mind or spirit, uh, which develops dialectically, and I really like that. So I, I find, even though I don't agree with Hegel, you know where he ends up, and I don't agree with his his, um, you know, some of the twists and turns of the dialectic. I, I, I would love to be able to to read this the rest of my life. So those are the top five. Now let's talk about the, the top ten. So we're adding in the next, uh, the next ones. And I do have some Aristotle, and this was a very, very tough choice. Um, this is the Loeb edition, which has, you know, the Greek on the facing page and, and the English, uh, which, is, which is good, because um, sometimes Aristotle's Greek is rather <laughs> obscure, and you need to actually see what somebody else had to say about it. Um, why the metaphysics? This was, this was very difficult to decide. You know, why not the politics or the Nicomachean ethics? Or if we have to pick another one, possibly on the soul. Um, well, the, you could make a good argument for any one of those. And, you know, I actually do more work on the politics and, and the, the ethics. And I teach them more often than I do the metaphysics. But I think that if you only had the chance to read one work of Aristotle for a long time, this would probably be the best one to do. And it would, it would be a real head cracker because he's, he's, you know, dealing with a lot of concepts that are, that are difficult to make sense out of. It does help to have the other texts, I have to say, uh, when, you're, when you're reading Aristotle. But I think this one could, could stand on its own. And it will introduce you to things like actuality and potency, or the four causes, or what privation as opposed to, you know, um, the fullness of something is. And those are really worthwhile to think about, even if you can't find immediate application for them. And even if Aristotle's wrong in his metaphysics, 
it's something worth grappling with. When you tie it in with some of the other works, you know, like Aquinas's Summa Theologiae and Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit and Plato's Republic, I think it assumes an even greater strength to it that, that makes it more worth uh, engaging with. Uh, we jump all the way it, back into the modern period, and I pick um, Descartes' great nemesis, the one who called him useless and uncertain, inutile et incertain. Um, the guy who, who said that Descartes brought in God just to get his system going and then left him all over to the side, and that's Pascal's Pensées. And the Pensées are fairly systematic, but they're also somewhat anti-systematic by their very nature, by what they're trying to grapple with. It is a work of apologetics uh, that, that Pascal was never fully able to finish. So it's sort of like, you know, Nietzsche's will, will to Power or um, some other people's works where it's, it's their, 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 uh, their naklas, the, the works that were left behind that uh, somebody else had to compile. But what's there is just brilliant. And I would love to, to read uh, Pascal for the, the rest of my life as well. So this is, this is a work that I've derived a lot of um, enjoyment and benefit from over the course of, of, uh, of my philosophical career. Um, now we jump into the 20th century. Martin Heidegger's Being in Time. Um, not a book that I, I, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have put in there, but it's really grown on me over time. Uh, I really enjoy some of Heidegger's analyses. After you get your way past his weird language that he comes up with, um, but you know, if you can get through Hegel, you can get through Heidegger uh, in that respect. Um, he's got a lot. He's got a lot of of really great insights to communicate. He's wrong about some things. I think you know, definitely wrong about about certain things. But I think he's also got some things. Uh, very right. And this is one of those works where you're going to get discussions of other thinkers, you know, like Descartes or like Kant or like Aristotle. Uh, and so that makes it, you know, very enjoyable as well. Um, Max Scheler's Formalism and Ethics and Nonformal Ethics of Values. You can see how thick this book is. It's got a lot of, of really great material. Scheler was a phenomenologist. Um, who is a contemporary of, of Husserl and Heidegger. And, you know, from Husserl and Heidegger, you get one genealogy of phenomenology. From Shaler, you get, you get another one. Um, and Shaler was very interested in, in value and in, in ethics. And so he, you know, he discusses just all sorts of things. You know, the subtitle, A New Attempt Towards the Foundation of an Ethical Personalism. Shaler thought that persons are what are fundamentally uh, most real, you know, it's a personalist metaphysics. And he just discusses, you know, topic after topic after topic in a, in a, a very um, innovative way. And if you could only pick one book by Shaler, because he wrote a lot of other great books, for me this would be the one. And what's great about this is he's also going to discuss as many of the other ideas about ethics and value and in, in the process about metaphysics and, and epistemology and how we understand things uh, as he possibly can on the way. So he's going to engage Aristotle, he's going to engage Augustine, he's going to engage Kant, he's going to engage even you know, people like, like Hegel to a certain extent. Um, the last one, somebody by the way who Shaler uh, invited to collaborate with him on Kant Studien when, when Shaler was in charge of it and who turned him down uh, for a variety of reasons. There's, there's a lot to be said there. Uh, Maurice Blondel. And Blondel wrote a lot of works as well. Um, Blondel was called the French Hegel or the Catholic Hegel by, by many people because what, what he's doing in this and what he's doing in his other works is very similar to what's going on in the phenomenology of spirit. He's tracing out this entire dialectical development, you know, working from the bottom level all the way up to the highest forms of society, culture, uh, religion, philosophy, and trying to, you know, do a, a rigorous 
analysis from an essentially phenomenological perspective. He calls it the, the, uh, the method of imminence, uh, but it's really a type of phenomenology, uh, antedating Husserl, by the way. Um, and it, it's, it's great. It's, um, it's very systematic, but it, it, it's not, you know, it doesn't have the sort of stultifying problems that philosophical systems do because Blondell was very attuned. I mean, the book's called Action, and he thinks of thinking itself as a type of action. And he's interested in seeing how not our just thoughts about being, you know, cause things to, to be the way they are. He's interested in seeing when we're acting as persons, um, what comes out of that. And so, you know, just brilliant work. This is actually the translation I would recommend, the, the Blanchette translation. So, those are my top ten if I was stuck on a desert island and could not ever get my hands on any other philosophical works, books that I would bring along in the, uh, the raft, the, uh, the canoe, what, what have you. And like I said, I had to give a lot of thought to these. You notice that most of them have a couple qualities in common. They're by top-notch thinkers who, um, you know, just bring brilliance to whatever it is that they're, they're studying. They're systematic. They are working out a, a rigorous, unified conception of, of things, trying not to leave anything out in the process. They, for the most part, engage other thinkers, other people, other developments within the, the history of ideas. So by reading them, you are getting their take on things, but you are at least getting a take on, on the books that you weren't able to bring to the island with you. And those three aspects really go into making them, in, in my view some of the most desirable works to, to have along.